Welcome, adventurers, to the Indie Game Lunch Hour. Today we're talking with Bader Alcatani, a combat designer over at Studio Pixano, about what it takes to become a combat designer in the game industry. The Indie Game Lunch Hour. I love it. We're seeing like boxing gifts in the chat already. Combat design is a really fascinating area <laughs> of conversation. I'm really excited to get to it. So in our live magical podcast, y'all know who we are. We give game devs the chance to hear stories of breaking in from industry experts, as well as directly ask them uh, questions about their areas of expertise in the second half of each episode. This is a mostly unedited recording of a weekly event we host in our Discord, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So feel free. We want you to come and swing by and join us for the next one. You can ask your own questions live. There's links to join down below. As always, I'm your host, Willem Delventhal, the headmaster of the Indie Game Academy and the purple wizard of games or whatever. And joining me today is Vader Alcatani, a game uh, game designer and combat designer over at Studio Pixano. Uh, welcome, Vader. I'm so excited to have you on the show. What are you having for lunch today? I just had a sandwich, to be honest. Uh... And yeah, it was a pretty good sandwich. I had an almond butter sandwich. That was it. <laughs> and, like just bread and almond butter? Just bread and almond butter. Quick, surefire way to get the carbs in and get the protein in. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That's uh, definitely not one I've heard before. I love the simplicity of it. You know, maybe this is like already some commentary on your design methodology. Uh... <laughs> I am personally juicing right now because my partner and I decided we were too unhealthy for the past month or two. Um, so I'm just drinking juice. So if I'm angry today, that's why. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, everybody. So um, I'm Bader. I am a combat designer. Um, uh, I, I've worked on a I've worked on a couple of fan games before. Uh, and, you know, eventually, as I kept working on fan games, I decided I wanted to pursue game design as a career, uh, got into the NYU Game Center, and I uh, realized I was a combat designer uh, because I just loved fighting games and I loved working on combat-oriented games. And uh, I ended up stumbling into uh, Nathan Kelman, who was on the podcast, I believe. Uh, just a wonderful guy, just really, really awesome. And uh, he got me into the design den, and um, I hopped on a call one day, and my mentor, Alex Brzee, who's currently my mentor, my instructor, um, got, got to take a look at my portfolio and referred me to Studio Pixano, and the rest was just, that was it. That's how I, that's how I got in, and it was pretty awesome. It was pretty cool. Uh, very, very lucky, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as it happens with many people in this industry, it sounds like. That's awesome. I love it as the origin story. I want like a little bit more detail. I want like 20% more detail. So tell me, first of all, where, what most people wonder about, what most people listen to this show for, is those steps before you got that first job. So tell me about working on some of these fan games, maybe some of your methodology. Uh, elaborate on the story for us a little bit more. Well, yeah. So, um, you know, it was back in 2014. I tinkered with this really old fighting game engine called Mugen. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but it's mm. this really wacky engine where you get to pick or install as many characters from different franchises as possible. and You kind of put them in a fight together. Um, and it's it was really chaotic. Um, I, what I ended up doing was I wanted to edit those characters in a subset uh, software called Fighter Factory, where you would kind of tweak frames of a character. And uh, lo and behold, I had no idea that was how frame data was like, you know, that's that those were the little minute details. Frame data was what I was doing. And I was just like, maybe this hmm. attack could seem faster. Maybe this attack could seem, you know, slower. Uh, and uh, that went on for about two to three years. And then I was like, maybe I should pursue game design. Maybe games is what I want to make. Um, and uh, eventually, that love for fighting games developed, and I was interested in Unreal Engine. Um, and I wanted to uh, create fan games and translate those 2D fan games into 3D space, because that was just, wow, that was, that was the big thing that I wanted to do. Unreal Engine is huge, and maybe I should just learn that. And, you know, uh, I could work on a couple of YouTube videos detailing these, you know, fan games. and. They got a lot of traction, um, and I delved deeper into Dragon Ball, which is my favorite show of all time. It's just really yes. passionate about it. Yeah, and rest in I, peace. Uh, yeah, rest Toriyama. in peace to Akira Toriyama. <laughs> yeah, my God, what a loss. But 
And then I ended up, um, you know, looking at these Dragon Ball characters as design opportunities. When you look at Trunks and you see that sword, you just the first thing you think of is just slicing up a bunch of enemies. How would he be able to do it in relation to his own character? He's a very stoic, very quick, very efficient and stylish character. So when you combine Dragon Ball and Devil May Cry, how does that work, right? How do those abilities translate into a game like Devil May Cry? How do those things combine hmm. together? What are the challenges that are, that are being posed to you? Um, and um, eventually that turned out to be combat design. When I looked it up, I was like, what? That exists? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, uh, then I got into NYU, the NYU Game Center, just incredibly amazing people, incredibly amazing mm -hmm. students, um, awesome faculty. Um, and I went on to keep working in Unreal Engine and worked on a bunch of college projects with some awesome people. Um, and yeah. That's 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 how that's how combat design was just you know that's how that's how it clicked for me, just seeing just seeing happened. a bunch of just seeing a bunch of people just beat each other up. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And then so you ran into Nathan Kalman, you made a relationship with him. How did you actually land that first job at uh, Pixno? So uh, it was it was really uh, it was really funny. I ended up uh, submitting a cover letter. This was before Pixano by about I believe I think it was about half a year or so. And it was at uh, a Discord server, um, and nobody responded to that. And I was kind of mm -hmm. weirded out by it until I got this DM from a guy, and he was just like, "Do you want to call?" And I'm like, "Who is this person?" <laughs> it's, it's, it's complete strangers asking me to call. I don't even know you. Um, and uh, I, I just took a look at his background. And I was just like, "Wow, this, this person's incredibly talented." Like, hmm. sign me up. Let's 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 start talking. Um, hmm. And he starts giving me feedback, and he was so kind, so humble. And um, he just gave me a rundown of the you know the whole spiel: how to write down resume, how to how to make a killer portfolio, all of those you know first steps to breaking into the industry. So he took his advice, uh, and then he invited me over to the design den, and I uh, introduced myself, and I started to hop into lounge calls all the time, you know, just kind of making friends, um, just started to geek out about combat, geek out about video games, anime, everything. Uh, and uh, one day, uh, I was just talking about, uh, you know, people were asking me if I was, like, if I focused on enemies or uh, animation for combat design, and Alex Brzee hops in. And Alex is my, he's currently my mentor and my instructor, and uh, he asked me the question, he was like, are you an animation-focused combat designer or are you an enemy-focused combat designer? And I'm like, I don't think I'm an animation-focused combat designer. And uh, he asks me to send my portfolio. And I sent over the portfolio, and he was like, "All right, well, listen, we'll set, we're setting you up with an interview with Studio Pixano. I just I just emailed <laughs> somebody that I'm working with, and that's that's just how it happened. And um, everybody at Studio Pixano is just absolutely incredible, just phenomenal people. My lead, my lead, Andrea, Giorgio, my coworker, uh, uh, Max, our creative director, um, just phenomenal people. Uh, very eternally grateful. Very, very, very lucky. Definitely, but." Uh, yeah, that's that's just the story of how I go. Amazing. The origin story. That's beautiful. I think um, there's a lot to pull out of that. I, I, I say that, I think, every single origin story. Um, there's a meme that I like bringing up now and then where getting a job in games is only 10% what you know and what you've studied and what you've practiced. It's 30% who you know, and then it's 60% kind of just being at the right place at the right time. Um, and I think it's very true, and I think your story uh, showcases that exactly. Um, and showcases something that I want to echo for everybody here who's listening and trying to break in. There's a certain kind of uh, person I work with now and then who's upset that there are requirements for what must be done before they get into games, and that specifically the, like, uh, stereotypical, you have to have three released games for a junior level role. I totally get why that's frustrating, but also listen to uh, Bader's story here and um, understand that that's really what they're often talking about and is often enough to land you that first job. It's mostly just these personal projects, getting curious, getting excited, and making games, because like that's what we're all here to do. Um, and so if you aren't making games, I'm honestly kind of confused. Like, I, I, you know, gatekeeping, let's destroy it. Hell yeah. But also make games, yo. Get into it right now. You don't need to wait until somebody gives you a job. Obviously, time is real. Obviously, finding teammates is real. But even working on your own stuff um, and releasing your own stuff is totally possible right this second. I want you to do it. And those games count. 
obviously the better they do the better um and the better they are the higher quality they are the better but you can absolutely get that experience now so i love that you started by just like getting the experience and i love that it wasn't this like necessity or this burden and it was just kind of curiosity and excitement um i think that's what makes the best designers personally and i think that's what makes the best everybody but i'm a designer so i know that best um and then i love that honestly the first job was just kind of being there um and it's another part of the puzzle um the quote that i always give is that 80 percent of jobs are filled by referral in the game industry uh and it and it tends to be true because we all Number one, we want to have we want to work with people that we trust, and number two, it feels really good to give people jobs. So when you have that job to give, and you run into a cool young person who's kicking butt like Bader, you know you want to give it to them. Um, so make sure you're in the right places, be around other people, showcase yourself, output yourself, show what you're capable of, and continually build your skill set and continually build your portfolio. That I feel like is some of the biggest takeaways from what you just told us. What do you think, Bader? Absolutely. I feel like um, when you're at the right place and you know, you're with the right people, that's just absolutely essential to building a career and uh, building yourself as well. Uh, you get to learn from a lot around you. It's, it's not just like, oh, how do I break in? But also curiosity. You know, um, you can speak to level designers and understand their, their design philosophy. You can um, follow their guidelines on how to design good levels. Even if you are a combat designer, curiosity in other fields is really, really important. Iron sharpens iron. I always say that, iron sharpens iron. So nice. just really, really learn from other people. Be around people mm. that you would want to learn from and you would, you know, you're curious about. It's not just about landing the role, it's also about developing that necessary skill set as well. Yeah. And in my opinion, the best developers, not just designers, are people who are like that forever. Um, you know, they're 10, 20 years into their career and they're still like, whoa, that's cool. Like, let me go find out about that. Um, that's that's a, a mentality that never, uh, never disappears and also never disappoints. It's always valuable. Um, yeah. I love that. Thank you for telling us that origin story. I want to talk about combat design a little bit because combat design is cool um, and it's a great niche. It's one that all of you can consider getting into. Um, something else maybe to take away uh, and another thing that I say all the time is definitely niche yourself as best you can when you're a junior. Um, the more uh, specific your skill set, as long as there are jobs for it, um, the better in general. Uh, so let's learn about this niche combat design, specifically an animation uh, oriented combat designer. Tell us, Bader, what are your what is your 101 here? Give me the like introduction as if I were an idiot, which I probably am not. I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so combat design is um, the, there. There are so many ways to go about it. Um, you can focus on animation, like in Studio Pixano, my coworker Giorgio focuses on enemies. I focus on polish and animation, uh, and um, I work on some some boss animations as well, just kind of like tweaking those out. <laughs> Um, so if I were to just kind of say it at a high level, it's about, it's about deconstructing combat systems and getting your hands dirty, analyzing those systems and introspecting, ensuring that you're also seeing what needs to be changed and what doesn't need to be changed, seeing what fits the puzzle mm -hmm. and what doesn't seem to fit the puzzle. Uh, you know, it's also important to ensure that you're focusing on animation, visual effects, programming, and production. It's a highly interdisciplinary field. You're communicating between different departments back and forth. Um, and, you know, it's really important to get your ideas across as quickly and efficiently as possible and always ensure that you're dependable when you're around uh, these departments. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, to, to kind of bring it back to the top, it's about deconstructing, it's about analyzing, it's about ensuring that you are seeing what needs to be changed, what doesn't need to be changed, what seems to fit the puzzle and what doesn't seem to fit the puzzle in terms of player abilities mm -hmm. and in terms of enemy abilities. How do enemies challenge players? How do players challenge enemies? How do those work in tandem? How do those two collide with each other? Mm -hmm. Amazing. OK. Um, and without violating any NDAs, uh, tell us what you do on a daily basis. What is the life of a combat designer? So it's a lot of communication between myself, animation, visual effects, and programming. What we have is we get these concepts from our you know, creative director. And we uh, start ideating with the combat team. Uh, we analyze attacks. We start to conceptualize attacks. Uh, we, we get concept art on board, and we start to uh, detail those attacks. Um, and uh, the, the most important thing is we're not just haphazardly thinking of attacks. We really meticulously think about how these attacks encourage player behavior. 
Mm. Up next is we have meetings with, you know, the animation team, the visual effects team, the programming team. You know, for programming, we start to talk about tools. What are the tools that designers need? Um, what, what do we need? You know, how, 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 how are we going to be able to control how these enemies and players, how, how these enemies behave, how the player attacks enemies? It's very important to consider tool making when you're working on combat because, you know, tools are essentially the driving factor to good game feel. Um, and then with the visual effects, it's having a discussion about how they communicate the attack boundaries of, say, an enemy. And then we speak with animation to uh, figure out the poses of uh, how enemies attack, you know, what's the anticipation, what does the tell look like, um, what does the follow through look like, what's the recovery look like. Um, and then we get those block ins, we do a lot of frame data, and um, we iterate, iterate, iterate. Amazing. Yeah, it sounds, you know, it's a it's a combat oriented game designer. It's a lot of the same stuff that a lot of game designers do. Um, all games are interdisciplinary, by the way, all game fields, all game disciplines are interdisciplinary. But I would say design is particularly because essentially what you're doing is like navigating how to make something interesting from a bunch of disparate parts. Um, so, so much of your job as a designer is like, hey, engineer, I was trying to do this and it seems impossible. Is it possible? Uh, and like, that's your day. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it. So why don't we get the like, what are your what are your hot takes? What are your hot tips? Somebody who wants to be um, wants to make effective. Let's talk actual design first. Um, somebody who wants to be an effective combat designer. How do they put together an awesome fight? Um, that's a great question. An awesome fight. Just don't get stuck ideating for too long. One of the things mm. that I always constantly, like, that I constantly see when I teach people or try to guide people into combat design is they get stuck in ideation land. Uh, mm. Combat design is very, like, you have to get your hands really dirty, at, w whether you like it or not. So you need to get your ideas across as quickly and as efficiently as possible um, and just really hop into an engine of your choice and translate those ideas across. Amazing. So, yeah, I it's a it's a it's another similar tip to game design in general. Um it's really tempting, especially I actually think there's like a deflection point fairly earlier in your career, but after a little bit of experience where you've done enough design to know a lot of the pitfalls, and so you spend much longer ideating trying to avoid trying to avoid a bunch of the pitfalls, and you wind up kind of getting stuck there. Um, cause you're like, well, I'll come up with the perfect design and then I won't run into these problems again. Um, but the reality is like game development is about iteration. Um, and honestly, I've come to believe at this point in my career that like basically any design can work. It's more about how close or far it is from really working and hitting the, the objectives that you have for it. Um, and iteration is how you get closer and closer. So like, it doesn't need to be the perfect idea. It needs to be a pretty good idea and then iterate from there until it's awesome. Um, that's my opinion. Yeah. It sounds like when you echo, Absolutely. which is awesome. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So the topic of today is meant to be what it, uh, what does it take to be a combat designer, which is very much about, you know, breaking in and getting started as a combat designer. So I'll ask you now, uh, Vader, what does it take to be a combat designer? Um, it takes a lot of just, I guess it's 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 important to prioritize quality. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you said, there's there there are these rules that are out there where like they tell you you know you have to have three released games or three projects or. Um, I only have uh, as far as I, on my portfolio. I haven't seen my portfolio in quite a while, but I only have three release projects on there or two. I think two probably. I don't know, but it, it was very important for me to maximize on the quality and take my time. Um, mm -hmm. So if you are considering getting into combat design, focus as much as you possibly can on quality projects that look mm -hmm. really good, that feel really good, and they really match what an employee wants. Um, one of the things that I used to do back when I was applying for Pixano was I would look at AAA responsibilities and roles. I would look at the bulletins and what they would request from design or combat designers, and I would sort of develop projects in, <clears throat> in relation to those responsibilities and needs. Um, mm. So for an example, uh, if you want to work on uh, you know, weapons or abilities from concept to completion, how would you be able to do that with relation to what that employer does? Say for an example, 
Um, it's Sony Santa Monica, right? What what do they what do they do? They work on God of War. What the responsibility says that you have to do something or you have to create a weapon from concept to completion. What kind of weapon would you create from concept to completion on a project with relation to what Sony Santa Monica needs? They work on God of War. Yeah. Maybe you can work on something similar to God. Um, so that's how that's what it takes. It's really ensuring that you're hitting those quality points as efficiently as possible. Um, it's ensuring that you are looking at those responsibilities and matching those responsibilities with relation to the projects that you're currently working on and taking your time. Do not rush a project. Take your time with it. Mm. That's awesome. Um, another one, a lot of the stuff you're saying, I feel like is really applicable to everybody, which is great because that means no matter who you are as a listener, I think you can learn something here from Vader. Um, yes, the I love the concept of just looking at AAA responsibilities. So. Uh, some people are, are are maybe confused by this or are um, are I get asked pretty often where to find what I should be practicing, whatever my role is. Like, hey, I want to break in as X. What should I practice? Um, and the reality is, no matter what your role is, looking at job descriptions is how you find out what you need to practice. Um, and all of you can do that. And there are job descriptions out there for you to look at, even if they're already closed, by the way. Um, I love the idea of going and finding the biggest names, those ones that you really want to work at one day, looking at what they require in their list, because typically they expect more, and then just practicing what's in the list. That's it. Um, and I really like the concept of coming up with practice projects, actual releasable projects um, that demonstrate those things and help you practice those things. Um, that's something that every single one of you can do, no matter what your role is, and I think is really excellent advice. Yep. And uh, yeah, uh, to top that off as well is just be dependable. Um, when you're working in teams, just be as dependable as possible. You want programming, you want animation, you want visual effects to all depend on you. When they reach out to you, you have to have like a quick response. You have to uh, just be communicative. Um, that was probably one of the most essential things that I learned. Like I'm, I'm pretty early in my career. I uh, like it's, It hasn't even been two years yet. So I, I just started. It's been about a year and a half right now. But um, what I've learned so far throughout this experience is communication is absolutely essential. Be um, people's favorite combat designer to work with, right? Um, just be responsive. Be be willing to motivate people. Um, so yeah. Amazing. I love that. Be be uh, people's favorite combat designer to work with. So once again, insert whatever discipline you're interested in. You know, be everybody's favorite game designer to work with. Be everybody's favorite narrative designer to work with. Um, and that doesn't mean like placation. That means like get shit done, be responsive, um, you know, be accurate about your time estimates. Um, you could disagree with people, but like be good in the disagreements. That's a whole skill unto, into and of itself. Um, love that. Don't be the block, says Rick. That's Don't be the block. Point. That's a good one. That's a very good Don't be the block. <laughs> uh, all right. So I want, uh, I'm going to do like a practical question here, and then I think we'll move on to community questions. So my practical question is, what are some of the skills and or tools that people should be practicing right now um, to break into combat design? Um, so in terms of tools, uh, I would say Unreal Engine. Get into Unreal Engine. Uh, very, very important because that's uh, becoming an industry like that it's slowly turning into the industry. Well, actually not slowly, very rapidly turning into the industry standard. So learn Unreal Engine. Um, uh, practice game feel. Game feel is incredibly essential. Um, very huge part of the job. Uh, Tyvek Stallworth, who uh, you know a lot of people probably know, said that 50% of what makes enemies fun is the hit reactions. How does it feel to land an attack, right? Um, so very, very essential. Uh, and finally, uh, enemy design. Um, and that's a weakness of mine. It's something that I, I, I currently still struggle with, and it's very, sometimes it can be very complex. Um, enemy design is practically just understanding how enemies behave against players. Um, mm -hmm. How do they behave with relation to their, the player's position? Um, how do they uh, behave behind a camera? How do they attack you, depending on distance proximity? Those are the essential questions um, that you should be asking yourself. So those are the tools and skills. So if I were to put it at the top, learn Unreal Engine, get good with it, uh, practice game feel. Game feel is absolutely, absolutely essential to translate player fantasy and character fantasy. Finally, it's enemy design. You need to understand how enemies influence the player and how players influence enemies. Amazing. Yeah, I think, um, are you, I'm kind of curious, you said Unreal is uh, developing rapidly. There's the age old battle between Unreal and Unity. Do you find more combat design positions in Unreal? 
Uh, there are. I mean, I, I find more combat des combat design positions in Unreal Engine, and then there are studios that use proprietary engines. Um, uh, I've seen, like, I've mostly seen um, Unity combat, sorry, combat design positions provided to uh, provided by indie studios that focus on using Unity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I find in general, um, we still teach primarily Unity, for instance, because there seems to be more roles, just like period, in Unity. Um, but it definitely seems like um, combat design and definitely triple A's fall into Unreal more than Unity. Um, I'm actually curious, I meant to ask this earlier. Uh, when we say combat design, the primary thing you should be thinking of is fighting games, but there's a whole heap of other games that utilize it. Can you give us some other perspectives into where combat design might touch? Ah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, I think there's a huge, um, actually, it's good that you brought this up. There's, there are so many people that usually say that, oh, like, should I get into fighting games just so I can learn combat design? Because that, that seems to be the first thing that people approach, but no. Uh, <laughs> Devil May Cry, the character action games, Ninja Gaiden, your Ninja Gaidens, your Devil May Cries, your Bayonettas, your Dark Souls, your, your Souls-like games. Those are really, those are really great ways to get into combat design because, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, low barrier to entry. It's like very easy to, to learn how, you know, it's very, very accessible to jump into like, a, a, into Devil May Cry. It's very easy to jump into Bayonetta. It's very easy to jump into those games. Um, with fighting games, a lot of people feel incredibly overwhelmed because of like the amount of tactics and abilities you can pull off. Like one character could have a list of like hundreds of moves, like Tekken, right? So you're, you're just kind of like analyzing all these things and how they work together. Like, how do I pull off this attack? Is it high? Is it medium? Is it low? If it's low, how do I go here? How do I go there? How do I go here? Oh my God, it's going to take me so long to learn. But yeah, like you can, you can uh, start off with like your, your character action games and your stylish action games. They are such a great point to start. Amazing. I, I love that you gave us some other perspective because combat design really touches in so many points. Are you, I'm kind of curious, this is something I've just wondered myself, does combat design wind up touching turn-based games as well or is this strictly live action fighters? Uh, combat design does touch turn-based games, yeah. They're, they're you, nice. I mean, technically if, if, if you're working on a, a tabletop game and you're focusing on abilities between yourself and your opponent, you're already doing combat design. Like if, if you think... <laughs> this is just like you know general game design. No, no, you are you are also doing combat design. So if you like, how many how, like how many turns does this player take? They roll a die, or like how how many turns does that person take? They roll a die. Uh, how do I nerf that, or how do I kind of create a sense of interplay between them both? That's mm -hmm. combat design. You're doing it. Amazing. So I'm officially a combat designer because I worked on a Slay the Spire like deck building combat game. <laughs> That's what you're saying. <laughs> Pretty much that. Yeah. Nice. I'm putting it on the resume, no, 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 no. Applying, to, applying to Sucker Punch next week. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> All right, so let's jump into your community questions. It's time to involve the community a bit. This first one is from somebody who's asking me to read it for them. This is from Ro. Uh, Ro asks, we kind of answered this, but I'd love to go for you to go into it a little bit more. How are you able to use your experience working on a fan game to get into the game industry? Sometimes I think about working on a dream fan game, but I worry it'll come across as unprofessional. No, I don't think it comes across as unprofessional. In fact, a lot of, um, in fact, most of the interviews uh, that I had when I was uh, first applying for jobs, they, they asked me, like, oh, this seems pretty cool. Like, Dragon Ball Theme Breaker, wow. Talk to us about that. How did you work on these abilities? How did you work on these character abilities? And plus, um, it's like, while I understand that fan games seem to be really cool, um, I would say that it's it's very they're very difficult to work on because they are um you know when you work on a property like like when when you're when you're working on a fan game based on a property like, like dragon ball there's a lot of demand from the community right so mm -hmm. like it's such a huge community and people just will start to ask you questions like what is this coming out <laughs> so if you're working on a fan game just be prepared that when you're when you put it out there all the community is going to like ask you so many questions and you're going to have people jumping on like into your DMs. People are going to like try to, you know, press is going to try to communicate with you. And I think that's, that's while, while, while you might have your concerns that it might paint a bad image, it really doesn't. It actually mm -hmm. boosts your image in a way. I'm not saying you should just be making fan games because we don't want you to get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> 
but yeah, like it's it doesn't it doesn't necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you know it's you know you don't look professional. In fact, it shows that you have the experience and you're able to pull it off, and it's something that you're passionate. About. As long as you're not making any money, don't make any money <laughs> out of a fan game. Yes, please do not do that. It's dangerous. Do don't not do monetize. That. It's illegal. <laughs> do not monetize. Yeah, do not monetize. It's illegal. And always make sure you put a statement out there that says, hey, we're not making any profit, we're not accepting any donations, mm -hmm. we're not doing X, Y, and Z. This is just a passion project. I love this show, and it's free. And it's from fans to fans. That's, yeah. that's important. But yeah, just to hop on that. Um, love it. It's not, not a bad image. Yeah, it's it's actually it's a great answer. I'm glad you gave it. Um, and I'd echo the exact same thing. I've actually uh, come to believe that mods um, and fan games are actually a great place for people to start. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for it. Um, mods specifically uh, demonstrate that you're able to pick up other people's engines and use other people's systems, which is really valuable. Um, and you're also just learning that skill. You'll do that in pretty much every job, even if they're using an existing engine like Unreal or Unity, they're going to have their own implementations that are kind of unique. And the first couple of months of any job you get is going to be going, how the hell does this work? Um, that's normal. And it's that's why mods are, are valuable and skill building into and of themselves. Um, and then in addition, people love mods. Don't forget, recruiters and hiring managers are intimidating, but they're gamers too. Like, they also played Legend of Zelda and thought it was awesome. And so your Legend of Zelda fan game is totally going to make them giggle and get them, you know, excited. Um, so I, I agree. It's, like, kind of hard to say, like, yeah, go make mods and fan games because that's even better than your own IPs. Um, but in some ways, it actually is. Definitely don't charge money. Is illegal. And accept the, uh, the possibility of you getting shut down because it has happened and it can happen. Um, but for the most part, it doesn't. Um, and for the most part, it's actually good. Uh, and um, it, and it really is if the quality is high enough, it doesn't matter. People will like it, and it will totally be a viable experience. All right, yep. uh, I've harped on that enough. Rick is on stage with the next community question. Rick, would you like to ask? Yeah, so I'm sure you've built combat systems from scratch. So I'm curious, what are you when you are imagining a brand new combat design? How do you weigh the importance of what the player's hands are doing with the input controls, the mental flow state the player ends up in, and the visual elements that like make it look cool in the feedback that the player gets? Like, are any of these a primary consideration? Um, like, what's your take on the importance? Um, so this that's a really great question. So if if I were to kind of like sum it all up, are, are you asking how game feel is prioritized? Like, how do we prioritize game feel? Yeah, yeah. So, like, with the game feel, like, is it more about what the player's hands are doing, or is it how they're mentally getting engaged? Like, like, what what's the balance of all of that? So, first, it's important to identify how the player is getting engaged because that's the you know the baseline foundation. That's the design foundation. You want to make sure that the game that you're working on is fun. How does it mentally stimulate players? Followed by how good it feels. Um, and uh, don't like don't polish at the start because it's too costly when you're polishing at the start. Because uh, when, you're, when you're not kind of you know, creating a solid design foundation and you're not understanding how to mentally stimulate the players and you know, um, engage players against certain enemy archetypes, you know, helping them strategize, uh, and then you just start polishing those things without any iteration, you can't go back anymore because it's too costly to go back. So focus on a solid design foundation Iterate on that as you implement your prototype, and then finalize by doing those polish uh, details and just ensuring that it feels good. All right, so it sounds like the mental flow is going to be the the first consideration. Then you want to just make sure it feels good, and as you're play testing it, you can mentally know that this attack does a lot of damage. But you want to make sure that you, as the designer who already knows under the hood what everything is good, then you go back and visually do the tells so that it's properly communicated to the player, everything you know as the designer. Spot on. Cool. Thank you. Nice. Amazing. Rick continues to be an expert question asker. Uh, all right. Next, we have Victor. Uh, Victor is currently bouncing on a trampoline, they tell us. Um, so I'm going to read this one out for Victor. <laughs> that sounds Victor. cool. That sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> Combat design trampolines go together like peanut butter and jelly, almond butter and bread, actually. All right. <laughs> so Victor says, uh, I like this question. It's very specific, but it's a good one. I think it'll be an interesting uh, topic for a moment. Victor asks, how the heck would somebody improve the combat in a 2D Zelda game? It suits the time period well, but modern players want more modern combat. Any ideas would be helpful. 
perhaps some flocking question mark? That's a great question. You know, I've I haven't done two D combat in eons. What are what are some modern methods that you could use? Um, I guess how can you translate what seems to be incredibly popular in three D games into two D space? That that's also a really great way to approach uh, getting better at combat design or um, testing out your theories and your ideas. So. Yeah, honestly, just translating whatever seems so it's, it's, it's about researching whatever seems popular right now and what's out there and translating that into 2D space and just figuring it mm -hmm. out as you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I feel like uh, I could throw in a couple here. Um, Hyperlight Drifter and that sort of genre, I feel like is a great example of a more modernized 2D uh, combat. Um, there's actually a game I want to shout out here uh, from a developer out of India that I got to hang out with at GDC this year um, called Sojourn Past, S-O-J-O-U-R-N, Past. That's like Hyperlight Drifter meets a bullet hell. Um, and it's like beautiful and made by a solo dev plus a couple team members now. Um, but that's a great example of like, it's an interesting playable um, 2D combat. Um, I like the idea of just taking, of porting uh tools and systems from our 3d world that we know and we like into the 2d world a couple of the easy ones that pop up is just like a dodge roll we all love dodge rolls they all work <laughs> it doesn't exist in zelda yeah. <laughs> add it to zelda it'll work you know <laughs> yeah. pretty much nice awesome all right uh next we have i forget Oh, I think, oh, uh, yes. The next one is another person without a mic. We're getting a bunch of these today. That's totally cool, though. Uh, next question is from Harry. Harry asks, uh, da, da, da. yes, Harry asks, what was the process like of getting into the NYU Game Center? Would you recommend getting an MFA there? Uh, what, what Was that a good startup for your career, or would you have done that a bit differently uh, looking back? It was a really good start off in my career, to be honest. Um, I uh, went for the bachelor's degree. Uh, I met some very talented people. Uh, the faculty is just awesome and incredible. Students are just, just fun to be around, just such wonderful energy. Uh, I've heard such great things about the MFA program. A lot of incredibly talented people um, uh, graduate from the MFA program as well. Uh, the process of, of applying to NYU is you need to have a portfolio. You know, it's the general college application process where you write down an essay, um, ensure that you have a good portfolio when you're applying. Um, and yeah, also be curious and email faculty. Ask them if you, um, like, like ask them for feedback on your portfolio and your work uh, before you apply. So reach out to faculty, reach out to students who have, who have graduated or, or are currently at NYU, at the NYU Game Center, and, and message them and be curious and learn uh, from them, um, ask how they, they got it. You're doing the right choice right now. You're, you're asking somebody who just graduated from, from NYU, uh, the NYU Game Center. So yeah, um, probably the best decision. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, people ask me about higher education at this point, and I, I think that my main like hesitation with it is student loans. Um, but getting those connections and finding those real people you know, in your life is, I'd say, one of the most important things you get out of higher education. Um, I know nothing about the NYU Game Center, or at least very little. Um, so I would ask people like Bader here, um, or potential professors. That's also good advice for actually applying for jobs. Go ask people who work there how it is, slash for advice. You never know, you might get help. All right, uh, next question. Rick is gonna ask a second question. All right, so when you're working on a, an implementation within your combat systems, and at what point do you feel or can you tell that it's fundamentally flawed and perhaps you have to make like a drastic change or you need to just stop it? Like what's the best route to fix it or get out of doing that? Um, so the best way to do that is by doing it early enough. Uh, don't wait on it. Um, if you have a gut feeling as you're working uh, on a project, for example, if like you're in the middle of creating this Flareability, you're testing it out, and it just feels off, but you can't really um, like figure it out. Maybe the attack feels off, maybe the damage feels off, but it actually turns out to be the animation speed, right? I always say focus on the disease, not the symptoms. Um, tackle it immediately. Don't 
wait on it for too long. And usually it's a gut instinct when you're doing combat design because it's a lot of game feel mm. as you're iterating. Yeah, definitely. That sounds good. Um, d don't spend too much time trying to prop up something that's just not going to ultimately. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I think we've stopped playing the sound effect, but still, somehow I sense it's time for the question of the day. So this is where we ask the audience something that Bader has already taught us to reiterate one of the most important points, and we give out some house points for it. Here is my question. Bader told us three main things to practice if we want to become combat designers. The first person to type all three in the chat is going to get three house cup points. Uh, go ahead and type them in the chat now if you know what they are. If you're listening, speak them out loud, see if you get it right, um, and we will find out. Get into Unreal Engine, practice game feel, enemy design. Harry gets it. Harry, I see you are a cleric. Would you like to give those three points to the clerics? Well done, Harry. <laughs> cleric all day. All right. <laughs> Amazing. So yes, practice your game engine, your game feel, and your enemy design. And I want to reiterate another point, which is um, Bader's uh, idea to go and look at AAA responsibilities and roles on existing job descriptions. Go and find the jobs. They're not that hard to find. Search LinkedIn. Go to workwithindies.com. Uh, plenty of other resources. Use uh, Amir Sotvat's uh, job list. Um, find the jobs. Go and look at their roles and descriptions, the actual bullet points, and then come up with practice projects to practice the things that are in that list. That applies to all of you. All right. We're going to come back. We have time for one or two more questions. Uh, the next question is... Uh, um... I forget. Oh, Michael C. I'm going to get Michael... <laughs> or Pedrez. My bad. Peters. Peters, would you like to come on stage and ask your question? Hello. Hello. Uh, so I'm a software engineer major, and I'm uh, kind of intrigued with the combat AI, in which my question is, what are the key considerations when designing combat AI? And how can you create like a challenging com like opponents without really like annoying the, the player that's like playing against those opponents or like, you know, getting them frustrated on it? That's a great question. So first of all, what you want to do is look into behavior trees. Behavior trees uh, determine the uh, behavior of enemies. Uh, so basically, it just kind of goes from uh, a sequence of uh, attacks and tasks that an AI will do against the player. Um, now, if you want to make sure that an AI or an enemy is not like is frustrating or it's not frustrating, that's where I kind of get into enemy design. Number one is, uh, you know, there are methods that are used in industry standard attack ticketing. Um, how much does it cost to attack a player? How many slots are available for an enemy to attack a player? Um, how, what is the frequency of this attack? Um, how does the enemy attack with relation to the player's position uh, or with a relation? you know, or with their position around the camera or behind the camera. So those are a lot of things to consider. Um, but if I were to say, you know, if, if you wanted to kind of get into practicing AI, start off with behavior trees, number one. Uh, number two is to ensure that you are focusing on uh, the necessary industry methods to minimize and mitigate player frustration through attack ticketing, um, conditions and behaviors and how enemies can attack off screen or on screen or enemy or enemy aggression system. All right. That, does, that, does that answer your question, Peters? That does. Awesome. Yeah, all right. So of course. Uh, all right, we have another one from the audience. Uh, this is from Michael C. Michael asks, what are some things I should consider as a level designer when working with a combat designer? What are your mutual goals? Okay, so both of those, level design and combat design, are very dependent on each other. If you have excellent combat design and your level design doesn't kind of, and your level design is not up to the quality of combat design, that, you know, the quality of combat design will dip. Uh, because when you're working on enemy architects, for an example, and you have a subset of behaviors or you have an enemy that kind of moves very quickly, if the space is too small, then you're not really, you know, doing the combat designer a favor. It's, it's just making things more frustrating uh, for the players. So both of you will have to be unified for the player experience. Uh, you have to ensure that you are creating spaces uh, for combat designers to, uh, sorry, you have, you have to ensure that you're creating spaces that allow combat designers to have more expressive, um, you know, enemy AI, uh, and you want to ensure that you are accommodating level design and bridging the gap 
in communication between yourself as a combat designer and a level designer uh, by making tools for them. Um, so if they tell you that, um, like, we want this enemy archetype to kind of go to that markup cover right over there, you create a markup tool. How big is that markup? You're going to have to do that as a combat designer, and you have to collaborate and iterate with them. So they're very dependent. Um, just ensure that you're communicating constantly and that you're both accommodating each other. If one dips, the other dips. Hmm. Awesome answer. Um, yeah, I think uh, the 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 answer to all collaboration is communication. Um, overly communicate. Make sure you're available. I I love you know our point earlier, your point earlier about being dependable, being the person that is easy to work with, um, being somebody's favorite combat designer to work with. That's true for everybody, including other level designers. And if you are a level designer, it's true in reverse. You know, I want you to be dependable. I want to be able to say, hey, this space is not quite big enough for what I'm imagining. Can we, um, you know, reopen this a little bit or add a little space or whatever? Um, fantastic answer. I think last question of the day uh, is from Misha. Misha asks, how do you work with the animation team and cinematics to adjust the combat to look appealing and visually allow the player to see their strikes? Oh, that's a great question. So when I worked on our capstone project, Ember Point, we had cinematic executions that were similar to God of War. And what was really important to uh, you know consider when working on that game, especially the cinematic executions, is uh, the camera position really influences how much the player is dominating. When you're at a higher angle and you're looking at the player from above, right, and by the shoulder as the camera pans in, um, and the enemy is on their knees, it indicates that the enemy is, in a, is weak, right? The camera position really influences the emotion. Uh, so it's very, very important to detail and consider uh, camera positions with relation to combat executions or cinematic executions. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that was something that was really important to consider when I was working on Ember Point. If you kind of position the camera above as the enemy is about to slam an enemy into the ground and they're on their knees while the camera is just above, it kind of shows that the enemy is like, kind of like begging to, 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 to you know, uh, begging you to stop. It's, um, if I were to give a really great example, The Last of Us is, is one, of, one of the best examples as well. If you play The Last of Us and you kind of nail down an enemy across and they fall into the ground, the camera doesn't go from, you know, it just doesn't stay behind Joel's back it slowly transitions to the top, indicating a sense that mm. you've dominated the enemy. So the camera position is really, really essential. So that's how we handle mm. cinematics. Uh, that's how I handled cinematics on the, um, you know, uh, uh, on, on our capstone project. Amazing. That's super interesting and really goes to show, like, I, I feel like film and games are slowly merging more and more. And there'll always be two different mediums, but so much of the talent between the two is becoming the same. Um, and cinematics is very much... Uh, one of those. I went to a great GDC talk on Larian Studios um, cinematics with Baldur's Gate 3, um, and it was so cool. Like, so much of what they're doing is like, how the hell do we handle this damn camera, you know, <laughs> get it to work appropriately. Uh, love it. All right, so we're at the end of the episode. Before we say goodbye, uh, Vader, we love to do uh, two things. Number one is we love to assign a homework, a piece of homework to the audience. So what is something that the audience can do in the next week that'll take just about an hour or so um, to help them practice some of what we talked about here today? Oh, I prepared for this one. I prepared for this one. So uh, <laughs> pick a character, pick a character from a 2D fighting game and study them as you play. What makes them fun? Why are certain attacks prioritized over others situationally? And after you analyze that, translate that character into 3D space. How would they then work in 3D space? Are certain attacks permissible? Are they not? A good example is reuse Hadouken. Right? What are the differences between a Hadouken in 2D space versus a Hadouken in 3D space? Finally, for a bonus, prototype after you ideate and see how that character behaves in 3D space. Amazing. I, uh, Victor would like to propose an alternate homework, which is to go fight someone. What do you think about that one? No! No, 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 no! No fighting! No fighting! <laughs> 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 All right, so your homework assignment <laughs> from Bader Alkatani is to uh, pick a character from a 2D fighting game, play the game a bit, write down what makes them fun, write down their different movesets, write down why the different attacks behave the way that they behave, and then translate that into a 3D space. And the homework itself sounds like it's just design writing. So write out how it would work in a 3D space, just text. Then as a bonus, 
for bonus points, for brownie points, uh, prototype what you've just designed out. Uh, either in engine, maybe just do it on paper, some way for you to actually test this out and see how it feels. Amazing. If you uh, do this homework, when you do this homework, we want you to do this homework, tag us on LinkedIn at the Indigame Academy. You can also tag uh, Bader here, Bader al Um We'll have a link uh, down below as well, so you can find Bader easily. Um, and that's going to do it. So Bader, before we say goodbye, is there any last messages you want to give to the audience um, and or anything you'd like to promote? Yes, so I just wanted to say, guys, that with the state uh, that the games industry is in right now, don't lose hope. You are more than capable of breaking in. Uh, I understand that things might seem hopeless. I understand that it might be frustrating when you get those rejections, but keep on trucking and keep on being curious. Um, mm -hmm. It's never impossible. Uh, never at all. And hopefully things will get better. You know, uh, you know it's it's we're we're gonna get across this hurdle hurdle all together. So just don't lose hope and just keep on trucking. Keep on trucking as much as you possibly can. I'm doing finger snaps over here. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, you know, so much of what I people feel like uh, what I what did I just say? So much of what I think people need is just a friendly pat on the back, and that's what I feel like you're delivering here. It's okay. You got it. Industry sucks. Yes, let's acknowledge that, but also it can still be overcome. And hey, the best stories have garbage parts, right? You've got final bosses. You've got uh, the quagmires. You've got the terrible stuff, and then you get through it, and then the story is the better for it. <laughs> yes, the hero's <laughs> journey. Do it. You got it. All right. It is the end of the episode. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Bader, for actually a really fantastic episode. I've had a bunch of fun today um, and for answering these questions. Heck yeah. Uh, thank you for those who asked questions, and thank you to listeners for listening. If you are listening to the recording, we ask, as always, that you send this along to just one other person who's somebody else who might enjoy this episode, who might enjoy learning about combat design from Bader here. Um, and otherwise, come and join us next week for the next episode. There are links to join the Discord down below every single Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Adios. <laughs>